Okay, it is week five already. We are moving really, really quick. We just had week four. We just had our first exam. Please, anybody who wants to review it, I don't care if you were that 88 or if you were that 70, please meet with me because you're going to see these con these concepts redelivered, probably on HESI and maybe even NCLEX. This was an exam that tested growth and development, and it tested your knowledge on theorists. It is like so like abstract. It isn't like understanding a condition, a diagnosis, what to look for, how to treat it, et cetera. So anybody wants to meet with me, please make an appointment, send me a message in Canvas, and I will try to work at a time that's good for you all, okay? So with week five, you had the quiz three, we have discussion question four, and we have CJ Sims. You guys have been really great on keeping up with your assignments, and I don't have to really hound you, and, and that's really, for me, really nice. So I want to thank you all for that. So what tonight, what I plan to do is I have a PowerPoint on cardiac and respiratory. I'm going to try to explain it as easy as possible. Now, respiratory, it doesn't matter adult or child. I'm going to show you the differences, okay, so that you understand what is difficulty in breathing. What do you see? Um, and I'll always say adult or ch children. You know, uh, my first 15 years of my career was in the adult world. I did recovery room. I did open heart. I did CCU, ICU, ER. So I'm an adult pediatric nurse. So I'm one of those weird people. Usually that doesn't happen. But what it does, it gives me insight into what, you know, the differences are to try to help you understand, okay? So we're going to try to do the PowerPoint. Get you back. I need to get 10 o'clock for attendance. If it gets to 10 o'clock, we'll stop there. I will send you the recording from yesterday's class. Please, please, please review the Kahoot part of it, okay? That Kahoot part is very instrumental, has a lot of concepts, and some I don't cover in the lecture, okay? So please, it's a, a hint, hint, hint. Make sure you look at it. So here we go. Let's go with our <clears throat> PowerPoint first. <clears throat> so I did just go and redid this. I also redid the uh, cahoots a little bit. So there are some things there that I know that need to be emphasized. That's why I'm saying, you know, please look at the cahoots. The cahoots are so important. If you can answer those questions, you can turn them around and upside down and backwards. If you know the concept, you can answer any questions around them. And that's where your exam comes from and your HESI comes from. So make sure you do that. So week five, pediatric nursing, we're going to go under respiratory first, and then we're going to go into cardiac. Now, in the respiratory system, when we consider children, it starts with the upper airway, okay? the nose, the pharynx, trachea, et cetera, all of this feed into how to breathe and through the mouth and into the lungs. So it is considered part of it. So any condition in the oral pharynx is going to be listed and we're gonna list it in what it, you know, affects how the children. Now, upper airway, well, I just said what it is up here. And then we have the lower, which is more your aspiration, pneumonias, your atelectasis, your you know, just regular bacterial viral pneumonias. Now, when we talk about upper respiratory, we're talking about mostly viruses. Rarely will we treat them for bacteria. They usually just work them say, their ways out. Now, one of the ones that we think about with upper respiratory is something called respiratory cynical virus, RSV. And if you can see these pictures, I think it really describes it. An infant gets very sick. Why? They're obligatory nose breathers. Put mucus in there. How are they going to suck, swallow, and breathe? They can't eat. They're going to tire easy. And then they have a low-grade fever, like almost 101, just enough to get them feeling miserable. So infants are affected. As you see, as you get older, it is less of a problem as in, you know, breathing. 
when you get to adults, me and you, it's common cold. We get over it. We blow our nose, right? We drink fluids. We take Tylenol for fever and we feel better. Now, it can be a bacterial, but rarely do we treat it that way. Now, kids, what's the thing about kids and what do we need to be concerned about? Upper respiratory infections. Well, they're in the air. They're all over the place. So we know that even young children, infants can get it. But what happens is how does that body respond to these viruses? You know, they're always morphing, always changing. So there's always a new one coming around. And mommy's maternal antibodies, about three months are gone, you know. And now what happens is the infant is building their own immune system. Why do you think we give immunizations at two, four, and six months? And then at 12 months, 15 months, 18 months, two years, we're loading them up because we know mom's um, good antibodies are gonna go away. That's why many women decide to breastfeed because if they get sick, their body made antigens and then it's given to the baby in breast milk. Uh, that's one of the things. Now, when that um, immune system of the moms goes away, the mom's uh, maternal antibodies go away. Now the baby's on its own or partially on their own. That's when you start seeing them get sick. Usually when you see infants sick, it's usually upper respiratory. It's mucus, it's, you know, ear infections, which is all part of the upper airway, okay? As we get older, you know, toddlers and preschools, what have I told you about this age group? Many of them go to daycare, they take toys and they swap spit all day long, right? This toy goes from this kid to this kid in this mouth, this mouth, but they, yes, they are exchanging all of these germs, but they are making their body more immune as they do that too. I mean, you'll see, I just put my kid in daycare and for the last, been there a month and he's had four different infections every week. Well, that is the body trying to get used to it. Now, as we get older, it becomes more of the bacterial. Now, the body's getting used to it. We have done all of these exchanges of germs as kids, and now our body's getting more to the bacterial age of it. And we know that as we get older, we get more illnesses. Our bodies become more immune against things, right? The sicker you are as a kid, the better you are when later on. Now, in children... Everything's short and wide open. And if you think about mucus, think about it. You know, it's always being produced. A lot of younger kids can't get rid of it, right? They can't blow their nose. I mean, how much can you get with that blue little syringe trying to suck it out? You can't get all of it. So where does it go? Well, it goes to those areas where there's nothing there pushing them away, which is usually their ears. So all this upper airway, type of mucus, nasal stuff, then goes in the back of the throat and up into the eustachian tubes. That's why you're gonna have a lot of ear infections. That's why it happens. Now, what do you see when a kid is sick? Um, I think the first thing you see is the kids not playing like they should. Then you offer them pancakes for breakfast that they absolutely, oh my God, I'm having pancakes. And they're like, no, and they sit there and don't want it. They're not eating, a kid is sick. If you see them not playing, a kid is sick. And the first thing I used to do with my grandson, I put my hand on the head, I go, we got a fever. You always can tell when a kid looks sick. You know, they're not the type that like us as adults, keep going, keep eating, keep drinking. No, a kid stops eating, stops drinking. They sit in the corner. They don't want to play and they're not going to eat. What's great if they have a fever Medicate them acetaminophen or ibuprofen, and now their fever comes down. And what happens? They start drinking, eating a little bit, playing a little bit, right? So kids are remarkable in that in that way. Um, they could be really sick, sit in the corner with a blanket on them, and then they're up and they're playing around. It's like, wait, wait, where where did this kid come from? Because my kid was sick, you know, a half, about half an hour ago. Now, if a kid gets an upper respiratory, as nurses, what are our goals for that child? All right, you always have to think, nursing diagnosis, what is my plan? What do I need to do for that child? In respiratory, number one, we wanna let them breathe easier. That's always number one. Then we want them to be able to rest, 
be comfortable, no pain. I mean, ear infections hurt. So I'm making sure they get something for that. Um, also, we teach them as they get older how to wash their hands, how to blow their noses, how to put the tissues in the garbage can, right? That prevents that spread of infection. Keep that fever down, and then this kid's going to eat, going to drink. And the most important thing when they're with this upper respiratory type thing is that they're drinking. They're thinning out all of that mucus there, right? So the kid gets the mucus, goes up into the ears. The kid's screaming, my ear, my ear. Or you see a younger kid that can't tell you, banging their head, you know, ear, and they're going like this. Another thing you might see in even younger kids, hand in the mouth because their throat hurts. You know, they're telling you where their pain is, where they don't feel well. Now, how do we take care of otitis media? Well, we they have the pain, you go to the doctor. Um, of course, hopefully parents know how to medicate for pain um, because that's our number one priority. Kid comes in screaming and crying. Did you give him something? No. I'm like, please don't, you know, wait, give them something because it does hurt. We believe you that the kid is hurting. Okay. Now looking in the ear, it's a bulging eardrum. You're like, oh my poor little thing. Give them that, you know, ibuprofen. I prefer it over acetaminophen on the kids older than six months. Tend that little bit of anti-inflammatory I think works, but you know, it's just my choice. And of course, if they are otitis media, we see ear infection. If there's, you know, fluid coming out or not, we're going to be giving them like something like amoxicillin, augmentin. If they're allergic to penicillins, maybe it's going to be Zithromax. I mean, it'll be something to, to kill that because everything up here is staph. You normally have staph in your, your nasal and oral pharynx. It's just normal, okay? Now... If it continues, 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 they're having multiple ear infections, then they're going to consider doing surgical intervention. And they put tubes in. Now, I just recently had a tube put in this ear. This is just back in August because it had I had an otitis and a sinusitis and it built up and I could not hear out of this ear. I could hear just water swishing around in there. And they did it in the office. Now, children, they don't. And I'm going to tell you why they don't. Number one, you have to lay there. And once they cut it and you hear the scalpel going, kush, kush, then they put the suction catheter inside there, a thin one to suction out any secretions. Then they insert the tube. Then you try to stand up and you fall over because now your equilibrium is gone. So it is not cool for a child to get it done that way. And even for me as an adult, it was quite traumatic. And this is the third time I've had tubes put in in about the last four years. So I know everything about tubes. Infectious mononucleosis. You know, as children, we learn about this as a kissing disease, right? Mono is a kissing disease. Yes, it comes, it's from, you know, oral secretions. You can not sharing things, you know, toothbrushes and cups and soda bottles, whatever, but it is a hep herpes Epstein-Barr uh, virus. Epstein-Barr is when they get tired, lethargic, can't move. Also with this, and it's a virus, not a bacteria, they have this sore throat and fever and this lethargy and body aches. So they all, they really look like they're flu, maybe strep throat flu looking. They go to the doctor, they do a flu test, it's negative. They do a strep test, it's negative. So they say, oh, it's just a viral pharyngitis. Take acetaminophen, ibuprofen, and you'll be okay. Well, three days later, they're still sick. Now they've got the swollen lymph nodes in their neck and their arms and their groins, maybe. Maybe even their spleen and liver are a little bit bloated at this point. Maybe, maybe not. And they say, well, okay, well, everything was negative, but let's put them on antibiotics. Well, about three days later, now they're coming to the ER because now they're like, the doctor's not doing anything. The antibiotics didn't work. There's something wrong. My kid still feels bad. So we hear the symptoms. It's sore throat, fever, general aches and pains, all of the lymph nodes up. And now we're starting to feel the spleen maybe a little swollen. 
we're going to do blood test. And the blood test is going to be, of course, we'll repeat the flu and the strep just to, you know, appease the parents usually. But we have a pretty clue what's going on. So we do a CBC and a monospot test. The CBC is to look at the white count. Is the white count normal? Well, it's normal because it's a virus, right? So we're not going to see that. But the monospot uh, test comes back positive. Monospot positive, they have mononucleosis. So we know it's viral. We teach them acetaminophen, ibuprofen, fluids. They need to have rest. They need to have restriction of sports. No contact sports. They have other kids at home that like to rough house and roll around the floor. I had six brothers. I was always getting beat up on the floor watching TV every night. So I know that that can happen, right? So they can't. What did I say? The spleen is bloated. The liver can be bloated. And you need to protect that abdomen. So no contact sports. Keep that belly safe and keep his brothers and sisters off of them. They cannot go into PE, into school, until they're cleared by their pediatrician. Well, let me tell you about a nine-year-old boy. What I just said, the scenario, all of that is exactly him. Nine years old, came into the ER Saturday morning with his father. We heard it all. He had a phenomenal physician, one of my favorites at Nicholas, and me. And we go, hmm, all right. So we did the blood, la, 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 monospot positive. So we did discharge instructions. We told him no contact sports, protect that abdomen. He must rest. We told him about the risks of a ruptured spleen. It's like a balloon that will pop, which is the inside and you bleed inside and you'll die, right? Well, one week later, the following Saturday, I'm on duty and I am the primary care nurse for the whole ER. I'm the one that you get trauma in. I'm in charge for the whole 12 hour shift. We get this boy in. He was in the Everglades on an ATV with his brother, fell off on the ground, hit his abdomen. He came in by a trauma helicopter in full arrest and he died. Why? They didn't listen to me. Now I tell you this story, it still, hurts me. It was horrible. But I'm telling you so that you can, in the future, if you ever go to pediatrics, you can understand how much, what could happen if you don't just that no contact sports protect your abdomen. Okay. Now bronchitis, we've all had bronchitis when you cough at night, dry cough, nothing comes up and you cough all night long and you can't sleep ever have that? Um, many of us have. So it's a dry, hacking cough, non-productive that worsens at night. And you cough, cough, cough. So you may or may not have a temperature. Um, it's usually a viral sort of thing. Um, but what? how do we treat it? Well, there's actually two ways. You can put them in a the shower with the heat and make them breathe it in and maybe it'll help the lungs. But usually it's cough suppressants, like a good cough medicine. Ever hear a kid bark like a seal, like uh, this big croupy cough? Well, these croupy coughs are uh, something that happens because the upper airway has gotten a little swollen. Um, could have been an upper respiratory that turns into croup, and because it's swelling now. This is when the air goes in, the epiglottis is there and it's everything in there is swollen and so is that. So to get air in is a little difficulty. That's why there's inspiratory strider. Asthma is the opposite. You can get air in, but the bronchioles are all swollen. You can't get it out. Important concept I'm giving to you here. So croup. Is the larynx, trachea, and the bronchus, and it can turn into epiglottitis. Another name for croup is laryngotracheal bronchitis, and that's why I put this slide right after. And it is that barking. How do we treat it? We give a dose of steroids or a couple doses of steroids, an injection of steroids, 
Um, it depends on the type of steroid and when we um, are, are giving it. Now, let that croup go on. Don't get treatment. You know, just go into the shower, see if that helps them breathe, etc. Well, it can turn into that whole epiglottis that covers the trachea, that when you swallow food, it goes in your esophagus. This covers the trachea so you don't put it down your lungs. Now it's covering that tube to your lungs. You can't get air in. What is this kid going to look like? They can't swallow. They can barely talk because they're so swollen, okay? And you're going to hear as they're trying to get air in. They're going to look like an 80-year-old COPD who's tripoded over. They're going to be tachypnic, tachycardic. They're going to be retracting. They're going to look really sick. Now, when we suspect epiglottitis, nursing responsibility, Make sure you have an endotracheal tube tray to be able to intubate and a tracheostomy tray at the bedside. And you can understand why. We will give aerosols of epinephrine. So usually for, you know, when you have anaphylaxis, you give the EpiPen a shot, right? Well, we can give Epi directly in there and hopefully that will help. And at the same time, we're starting an IV and we're putting in some IV steroids right away. So let's say the epi works, you know, and then we give a shot of epi too. And then we give some um, solumedrol. We're sitting up. We're going to put them on some really moist air with a little bit of oxygen just to decrease the work, the effort of it. So epiglottitis drooling, bent over, you know, it's, it's where there's inspiratory issues. So RSV is another name. It's called bronchiolitis. You're going to see them used synonymously, those names, okay? Now, we're in Florida. So we don't really have a winter, spring, sort of like up north. But we do have some times which are higher level, usually from like September into May, April, where there's changes going on. Little bit of air temperature changes can create this RSV virus to go around. Now, RSV in an infant is dangerous. Normal, healthy babies, usually with teaching parents how to suction the nose, you know, how to take time with them, et cetera, et cetera, can have them at home and do really well. Well, what if the kid's cardiac? What if the kid was premature? What if the kid had other problems going on? They don't have any reserve, right? So these children, we can give them an immunization every month, one month, usually winter to early spring, very similar here, but not quite, it's a little different. Um, but for the first year of life, it'll be given to prevent this virus and it does work. It's called Synergis and it is a biologic. The name is Calvizumab. So you'll see either or. So RSV prevention, Synergis, Calvizumab. Now, another thing that happens to our young children um, is that they're always getting sore throats or they've got their snoring, right? And the adenoids are so big and they say, oh, let's do TNA and we'll do the ears at the same time. Sometimes they do all of them at once, right? Usually it's an outpatient procedure and then they send them home with the parents. So we really need to know how to teach the parents, don't we? So those kids know what's going to happen when they're old enough and the parents understand how to take care of them. So right after a tonsillectomy, you should avoid irritating or high seasoned foods, you know, lemons, limes, um, anything with a spicy, they shouldn't really have. Because if you think about what they do surgically, they cut out, cut out tonsils, cut out adenoids, and then what they do is cauterize it. So there's big scabs in the back of the throat. Can you imagine how that hurts, okay? That's really sensitive area there. So with that being in mind, you're not gonna gargle, you're not gonna just really toothbrush. Their mouth is gonna smell a little bit 
not great, but it shouldn't be really malodorous, okay? You shouldn't let them cough, 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 and if they are, notify the doctor because that coughing can dislodge a scab and a scab can cause bleeding. And I have actually had a little girl, she was six maybe, had her tonsils taken out or at least the tonsils. She had just seen the ENT and was cleared in the car on the way home, she vomited massive blood and clots, and they ran her in to Nicholas into triage, and I was the triage nurse. And she's throwing up clots. Now, I've got out a big pink basin, and it started to almost overflow. I picked her up, ran her into the trauma room, got someone to help me, got an IV and got normal saline and recessed her with fluids immediately. So tonsils can be a big deal too. Can you hear this? They're just scabs back there. They need to protect it. We wouldn't use straws or anything, nothing in the mouth. We're not going to look at there with a tongue blade. No, no, no. And if they're swallowing, swallowing a child, we need to tell the parents this could be bleeding too. Be careful because if they swallow too much blood, what's going to happen? They're going to vomit, right? So we should use, usually today, they just say aminophen, uh, acetaminophen or ibuprofen. Years ago, they gave Hycodan, which was a coding type of medicine, and we found children were getting too much of it. And there was more danger in giving that than just giving acetaminophen and ibuprofen. That's a change of practice that I have seen. So these kids, the older kids, they'll let you put an ice collar there and it feels good. And then they should really not be out running around outside. They let them play with their games. Let them have your phone and the iPads now. This is the time to let them because they shouldn't be running. And then older kids also that know how to chew gum, the ears, the eustachian tubes are very connected to back there and they get mucusy and they could be painful. And if they're chewing gum, it's like going up in a plane. It helps relieve the pressure. So make sure that they're not drinking anything bad, not gargling, nothing in the mouth. Make sure they have Tylenol or Motrin, ice collar, relaxing and that the older kids can chew the gum, okay? They say that about day five to 10, you shouldn't be smelling as much, um, but if you really start seeing a fever, it's not normal. These kids should not have a fever post-op. Again, it's telling you there's an infection, they're gonna need antibiotics. And if, of course, there's persistent earaches, fever, cough, anything, again, also call the doctor and they need at least a week, if not two weeks, relaxing. Now, children can get pneumonias for many different reasons. Um, we know it could be caused by inhaling baby powder. Oh, I used to love the smell of Johnson and Baby Baby, right? Uh, that stuff smells great to me. But all of that talcum in the air can, you know, harm their arm, their their lungs. Also, we know that even aspiration, you know, these kids spitting up a little bit, that can cause problems too. Pneumonias can be bacterial or viral. Um, usually we will treat the pneumonia with an antibiotic, usually, because um, it doesn't hurt better to be safe than sorry. Um, and mycoplasma is just a longer treatment of your pneumonia. And then we do give pneumococcal vaccines early in these infants because pneumococcal pneumonia is very serious. So we try to prevent it. Now, why do we have pertussis here? We give immunizations at two, four, and six months. We do that so that we're trying to not have it because it's extremely contagious and it's really um, threatening to young children. Young children can die from this very easily. And what we found is a couple of years back when I was still practicing at Nicholas, the um, we had in Broward County both had about five cases of pertussis. And they know that we all notify each other what's going on. So any children who came in like with these whooping and these coughs, 
we would immediately put them in isolation, put masks on them so that we could uh, prevent other children from getting it. The reason is because not all children get immunized. There are all different reasons why. It is religious, they didn't understand. Um, but when you don't get an immunization, it does put other children at risk. One of the things that you know was mind boggling is that even when you're immunized, you still can get the disease. For instance, chickenpox. Children immunized with chickenpox, the varicella vaccine, there's still a couple cases of that. That means they didn't get enough antigens produced, whatever. Um, we know it with COVID too. We still can get it, even if we're immunized. One of the things kids do is love is put everything in their mouth. Everything goes in their mouth. Um, we have beads, paper clips. Uh, they love quarters, not pennies or nickels or dimes quarters and they go in their mouth and they're just chewing on it and then it goes down and it gets stuck exactly right there this is a picture for one of my kids and you're like well what do we do well these kids usually walk into the er they're breathing but of course your concern is airway send them over for a quick x-ray i pull the x-rays up in the room and i show these children i say so why did you swallow a quarter? I mean, couldn't you find something smaller that might have gone down than a quarter? Well, this starts to break the ice. You can see I've got to build some rapport here. So the surgeon comes, and usually these are younger, like usually three, four years old. That's the, really the ones that eat this stuff. Um, some of them are younger, but the ones that I have met are slightly older. They sit on the, the doctor's lap and they take a Foley catheter with a balloon on the end. And they put the Foley down the throat, blow up the balloon below where the quarter is, have them lean forward and say, say, woof, and they pull it out. And what I say is, if I get the quarter first, it's mine. So these kids get it out, they throw up, the quarter's on the floor, and I'm going like I'm going to get it, and the kid says, it's mine, I win, and now he forgot what just happened to him, and I've done that repeatedly, and it works, it really works with children, so what do we do after that? We watch them for an hour or so, make sure there's no swelling, and we send them home. If we had to go down with bronchoscopy and pull it out, that's ER to OR, overnight and that's like a huge thing right so it doesn't have to be anymore like i said aspiration can be part of feeding or the powder i mean i love johnson and johnson to this day i think it's great but i can't use it anymore because of i know better remember even feeding can cause problems with pneumonias right so you have feeding and they spit up they can inhale it and that could cause problems so Teaching how to feed, how to burp, and having them sit up after feeds is important. Now, one of the other things that we see in children, and they're born with it, it's not like they acquire this, it's they're inherited. Uh, comes from mom or dad or whoever, and your children are apt to get cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is simply mucus that builds up in the lungs and in the small intestines. It impedes respiratory system and it impedes that nutrition and digestion. So what would you see? You have no clue your kid's gonna have CF and the kid is born. What would you see? This kid is not gonna have a stool. Don't most infants have that meconium stool? Um, sometimes right at birth, sometimes you know, within hours. So it is two days later, there's no stool. We're going to be testing this child for CF along with a couple other different things. And I'm going to go, um, as I see these things, I'll let you know, there's three different reasons why you would not stool as a newborn and things you'd be tested for. Well, what you would do is something we call is a sweat test. And it's something where this little machine sticks on you and they measure the salt on your skin. Now, if you 
were to lick a child with CF, it would be salty as salty can be. Now, I'm not telling you to lick any kid, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But if the parent did, I mean, let a parent lick them, not you, they would taste the salt. And that's what they measure. So they're losing salt like crazy. So didn't that tell you we're always going to put salt in this kid's diet, right? Because they're losing it, right? Now, because their lungs are clogged, thick, gelatinous, just like big clay balls in the lungs, we are going to be lung infections like crazy. The lung sounds are going to be horrible because it is so thick in there. Also, because the small intestine affects the pancreas and it doesn't secrete enough enzyme, what's going to happen is you're going to lose fat in your stool and it's going to be the worst smelling stool that you've ever smelled in your life. It's going to be foul smelling, greasy. Um, so these children are losing fat calories. You have carbohydrates at four grams. You have proteins at four grams. That is at nine grams per ounce. I mean, this is a lot of nutrition. So this kid's going to be tiny. So this kid, we have to worry about nutrition. So how do we treat cystic fibrosis? Well, if those lungs are full of infection, we're going to give antibiotics. Orally, IV, and then also in the nebulizer, we give a lot of antibiotics. So they inhale it and it goes directly into the lungs. We're going to be giving them albuterol and all sorts of medicine to try to open up and bring up so they expectorate all of this mucus. We're going to do aggressive, aggressive, aggressive chest physiotherapy, morning, noon, and night. Those vests that go, you might see one at Patches in the room downstairs. They put it in the corner there. And they go, and what it does, it loosens all of those secretions. And then they try to either suction or have that kid spit it out. And it keeps the lungs moving. Now, for the small intestines, we're going to be giving pancreatase um, capsules or powder. We'll never, those little beads that are in the capsule, these children can't chew it. Um, it's something that you put it on. Some kids don't eat these capsules so that you put it on their food a lot of times. Um, so they're eating it as they're eating food, which helps in digestion. So they get some of the fat calories. So they get the nutrition that they do need. Now, some of this medicine is in the form of a powder. This powder can get on the teeth and cause decay. You know, the calcium on the teeth, the enamel. So we rinse it, just like some of those respiratory puff medicines, right? You rinse your mouth, same thing. And the one thing in children we tend to forget is we need to increase doses as these children grow because it's usually milligrams per kilogram, right? And in one year, most children gain four or five pounds. It has to be increased because of that. One of the things with CF is wanting to be pregnant, especially older children. Um, remember, we're, these are born with CF. They're going to have it for life. And women can get pregnant, but they're high, high risk. All right. They can, and they can have normal pregnancies, but very high risk. Men cannot get women pregnant with CF. Something with the vas deferens does not produce the sperm. But if they do a bilateral lung transplant, one year later, Somehow the vas deferens work, their sperm works, and they're able to get their partners pregnant. So there is a possibility um, for pregnancy for men. Women, there's usually not as much as a problem, but it, again, high risk. Now, acute respiratory distress syndrome, something that happens for many, many reasons. It could be overwhelming sepsis. The biggest concern in children and shock is sepsis, infection. Children don't have an immune system. So infection is one thing we see as symptom. It needs to be addressed because 
they can end up in ARDS because the lungs get involved with it. It could be the trauma of many things in a car, in an accident, ran over by a car, fell off of a whatever, of a balcony, trauma, chest trauma. As they get older, it could be a drug overdose that they come in with. Adolescents, I always are concerned about. They come in and they're too drunk and they've been on drugs and you know they're half out of it. They don't know where they are. This is what I'd be concerned about. And then any child with a near drowning because of the hypoxic episode, and it can be up to three days after the initial insult. Now, these children are sick. If you look at that blood going in that machine in this picture, this is called ECMO. It is like a heart-lung machine, but it pulls blood off, puts oxygen in it, and it puts it back in the body. That's all it does. It doesn't support blood pressure, anything. But kids whose lungs don't work, infants with the lungs don't work, are placed on this ECMO. I was actually ECMO certified at Nicholas. And it, it ran one nurse to one patient with another nurse taking care of other it. So it's two nurses on one patient. Many of these children do well on ECMO and many of them don't make it. So if it's an ARDS problem, very high mortality for it, okay? Sick, sick, sick children. Now, CPR. You've all learned CPR, right? Y'all got certified. You know what to do. Um, now, you get into a hospital. We could take care of the child. We know what to do. But what about the mother and the father? Please make sure that you don't forget about the parents. Um, I've had parents in the room that you had to push out because it was too little of a room to take care of them uh, or some they didn't want to see it. And then the other kids who want to hold their child's hand, um, whatever it is, please take care of those parents because it may be the last time that they held that child alive. So, and if they're not in the room, um, make sure somebody is there with the parent, keeping them calm. Sometimes it can't be a nurse. You know, we have resources, we have supervisors, patient reps, there's other people that can be with them as long as we remember them. Now, asthma. Many of you have had asthma or know children who have asthma or have children with asthma. And it's something that their airways get very hyper responsive, usually it's due to some sort of allergen of some sort. And all of a sudden they're breathing in and, and they can't breathe it out. So asthma, get all the airway you want in. The airway up here is open, it's clean. Your problem is with the lungs below. So the air gets in, it gets trapped and it can't get out. And asthma, is uh, something in children, many of them grow out of it and many don't, but it's usually due to some sort of allergy. So how do we treat it? Well, we wanna know what lungs are, what their best normal is. So when they're doing well, we'll do pulmonary functions. We'll also do skin testing, seeing if they have allergens and why would we do that? Well, not only just for foods, but what if a kid likes to play, you know, football and he's allergic to grass? That's not a good idea, is it? Unless you've already built up some sort of immunity towards that, you know, which you can do with skin testing. But it lets you know, oh, you're allergic to dogs? Oh, I can't have a dog. Oh, cats are okay? I can have a cat. So uh, this allergy testing, yes, it's long, it's detailed. It's little tiny little needles. It doesn't really hurt. But then, you know, it's usually on the arms or the backs and, or the legs. And then it's they can get really elevated and itchy. It's a pain. It really is. But it can teach a child and a parent how to take care of themselves. Now, that bottom left box, you all know what they are. These are called spacers. And we use these for even adults who can't take a breath in and squirt at the same time. Squirt and some can't. So they take the mask, put it around their mouth. I have their little meter dose inhaler, their albuterol, stick it in the end. What's the dose? Two, 
puff, puff. And then they have the mask there. They breathe in and out four or five times and they got all the medicine. And this is really good for young kids, even one, two year olds. I mean, it works really well. <laughs> you can see this little kid here as a spacer. He's using it, isn't he? He's trying himself. Now, is he really doing it? No, but is he comfortable with it? Well, I would say so. With asthma, we're going to be giving them preventative medicine. In children, we use something called uh, Pulmacort, levoalbuterol, morning and night. And that has a little bit of steroid in it. It keeps the lungs from being sensitive, preventative. And then at age two and above now, we give a medicine. It's called Singular. It's like Claritin, but it's for asthma. You know, it's for the lungs and it does help prevent them. <clears throat> now, we do have those inhalers for when they need it. Short of breath, they're getting tight and they went somewhere or they ate something or something. They can take a squirt and they can relax the, the uh, bronchioles quickly. Now, if it becomes more than that, of course, we can give all different medicines. Um, one of the things that is given in an acute phase is your corticosteroids. Solumedrol is the big one, you know, that we give in the hospital for adults or children, doesn't really matter. Um, and it helps the hyper -responsive, uh, responsiveness of the lungs and it decreases inflammation. You can't get the air back out. You know, my husband was in the ICU um, at Baptist for 12 days and status asthmaticus. And he did not get intubated, but he had that machine, the BiPAP machine. And the only reason why he wasn't intubated is because I could talk him down. And it was an extreme, really scary. When you listen to his breath sounds, kids, adults don't matter. Asthma, you can hear air go in. And then when they try to push it out, you might hear at the end of a breath a little and that's it. And it might be in one lobe of the lung. So they are restless, anxious. They can't breathe. Children don't understand that. So it can be very scary. Okay, hearts. Now, when we talk about adult hearts, it's usually congestive failure. It's usually myocardial infarctions, right? Well, when we talk about children, it's usually what we consider congenital defects. What were they born with? Now, there are certain conditions that can happen because of, you know, a virus can cause a cardiomyopathy. Um, what about lupus? What does it attack? It can attack the heart, right? So that could be something uh, that's acquired. But when we talk kids, most of the time, we talk about congenital. <clears throat> now, have you gone over how blood goes through the heart and how long, right? Has it been a year yet? Probably. You need to know the heart. You need to know the valves and what it feeds. So I'm going to give you a brief overview, all right? So just think about the heart pumps. It squeezes that left ventricle, blood goes around the body everywhere, and then it comes back the last bit. I'm going to make it into the right atrium. So little flow going into that right atrium from the inferior and superior vena cava. In the right atrium, it goes through that valve, the tricuspid valve, and it goes into the right ventricle. And then it goes up to the lungs and into the lungs through the pulmonary um, valve and the pulmonary artery. It's all oxygenated, CO2 goes away, and then it returns to the left side of the heart now. There's actually four pulmonary veins. I didn't know that till I worked in the cardiac ICU at Children's. It was, oh, the four, I only thought there was one. They're like, nope, there's four. So there's big flow coming back into the left atrium, okay? Goes through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, 
Then it goes up to the aorta through the aortic valve, and then it goes into the body. Up the aortic arch, down to the body, goes into the kidneys, the liver, the lungs, or whatever it needs to do. Now, I want to discuss one condition right here on this picture and try to imagine this. Well, what if it goes out the aorta, past the subclavian, whatnot, the three vessels that go to the head, right after that, it gets kinked. Think about a garden hose. That garden hose gets kinked. What happens behind that? If there's a hole in the hose, it's gonna squirt, right? Or go back to the faucet, it's gonna try to be squirting out because it can't go down. Well, what does blood do? Well, it finds the level, the area of least resistance. It goes back into the left ventricle. I mean, the left ventricle is still gonna try, but it's like overwhelming now fluid in there. Goes up to the left atrium and it goes back into the lungs. And now you're in congestive heart failure from a kink in the hose in the aorta. And that is called a coarctation of the aorta. Now, coarctation of the aorta, blood doesn't go down to the feet. What would you see on assessment on a newborn infant? Well, little or no pulses in the feet, right? Blood can't get there or minimal. So what do you think the blood pressures down there is going to be? Low. Well, the blood's going up those little three things, up into the head and the upper extremity, right? Right on the aortic arch. It's going all the upper extremities. So if I feel an infant, no pulses or extremely weak pulses, I'm going to do a four extremity blood pressure. And what do I expect to see if it's what I think? Coarctation. I'm going to have bilateral lower extremity blood pressures and my upper extremities because there's higher flow it's going to be elevated blood pressures this is a concept you're going to see they love coarctation they love talking about the flow and where blood flows and blood pressures okay so not treated it's going to cause congestive heart failure guaranteed how do we fix it well, it's just a side thoracotomy. They go in and just um, take out the piece and hook it back up. And that's what it is. It's not really this big open heart as much. But if you can imagine that left ventricle has been stretched. So it's going to take a little exercise and get the heart where we want it. But now blood's flowing. The feet are warm. You know, don't have all that flow going to the head. Coarctation aorta just talk to you about differences in pressures and flow and what do you expect upper or lower high and lower pressures now when we have a child in uh, problems usually at birth we know and, and we take care of it now I had a little girl who was a coarctation she was almost three months old from the west coast and you know west coast doesn't really know cardiac and most hospitals don't really understand cardiac, especially physicians. They don't understand really a lot. And it's not their fault. They don't see many of them. Now, we got this little girl finally came over to us. Of course, I admitted her. And um, I looked at the girl and she was huffing and puffing and she was skinny. She was poor nutrition, cogn you know, cognitively, she was delayed. You know, I was like, oh boy, this poor little girl couldn't even breathe. You couldn't feed this kid a bottle because she was so tachypnic, so tachycardic. You know, she was extremely ill. She had congestive failure. Her heart was floppy and she had everything here. Poor feeding, tachypnea, tachycardia, poor weight gain. She couldn't do any activity. Cognitively, developmentally, she was behind. There was no history in her or her family, but she was coarctation in the aorta. Now, one of the um, nursing diagnoses, and, and you're going to be seeing this, 
is cardiac. And what would you, one of the, the nursing diagnoses is. So a poor weight gain, well, why? It's inadequate oxygen perfusion, right? You're not getting oxygen where you want, leading to activity intolerance, resulting in diminished energy to feed equals poor weight gain. So that's why we do a lot of daily weights and take outputs on these children. Um, so uh, I'm going to go into that in a second even more. We're also going to look at the kid, always look at nutrition, always looking at color. I mean, this little girl wasn't the nice pink that you would like to see. You could see something was going on. I mean, all this fluid was in her lungs. She had poor oxygenation going on. So her color wasn't good. You could hear it. You could hear a murmur going on. Um, and you don't see clubbing of fingers till later on. And I do have a picture as we keep going. Put them on the EKG. You're going to see them tachycardic. And not necessarily that they have dysrhythmias or irregular rhythms, but they're going to be beating more than 140 to 160. They're going to be beating like this 184 and even uh, saturations like 80s. And we'll put them on that little bit of oxygen, you know, just for rest. It's just for rest at this point. You know, and of course, you're going to listen to heart and breast sounds and all that good stuff. So you do the EKG and now we're going to do the echo and we're going to do that diagnosis. We're going to find out it's coarctation with a congestive failure. Um, many times to make sure that's the only thing that's going on, um, we'll be doing a diagnostic, which is finding out is there any other kinks, any other condition occurring with that child so that we can fix it when we open up the chest and look or the, you know, thoracotomy on the side, are we doing exactly what we need to do for that child? So um, these cardiac catheterizations are, you know, children, and they can be this little. I mean, if you look at that child, that kid there's maybe two pounds. I mean, if we're lucky, that's a really small child. And it doesn't matter if they're born with congenital heart problem, it doesn't matter their size, right? They're still born with it. Um, another way we do um, ec um, cardiac casts, something called interventional, um, there are children who, and adults, they get these all of a sudden rapid heartbeats and then it slows down and rapid heartbeats and it slows down. I mean, in adults, they put them on beta blockers, right? In children, they'll do the same. But if it continues, they're going to try to say, where is that little focus in that right atrium that wants to be, you know, the right atrium is supposed to be beaded by that S, that sinonatrial node, right? The sinonatrial node is supposed to initiate that beat. And when it doesn't, and another area does, you have these rapid heartbeats that's like sporadic. And in an interventional cardiac cath, they can take like a little laser. It's called EP studies, electrophysiology studies. They'll initiate where it comes from and they'll zap it. And then usually these children eventually can be weaned off of medications and they do well for the rest of their lives. And I think that's pretty cool. So how do you take care of a kid going to cardiac cath? Well, no kid in any surgery is going to be NPO after midnight like adults. Don't work that way. Infants can become um, hypoglycemic if they are left without eating, you know, for four hours. If you're breastfed, they'll let them feed up to two hours before the procedure, okay? Usually formula, it's three to four hours. Um, but we don't want that child, they still don't know. They're not getting stressed. They're still getting their food. They go up to the cardiac cath, they do the procedure, and they put two catheters in the right femoral artery and right femoral vein, right in the groin. And they thread these catheters up and they insert dyes and whatnot and take pictures and they look at the heart. When they're done, they take these very thick for these tiny kids, catheters out, and then the nurse holds pressure on that groin, that femoral area, until it stops bleeding. Once it stops bleeding, a pressure a bandage is put on. Older kids might get a sandbag, adults definitely. 
will have a sandbag. And they come back to your room. They take them off the table, put them back on the warmer or the bed. They roll them down the hall, bouncing them around, bring them into the room. And number one, you better check that dressing because they can bleed out that quick. Can you imagine two big holes, like the size of my finger almost? It's huge, the big catheter that goes in there. Think of an 18-gauge catheter on a little two, three-pound kid. It is actually like this on us. Um, so what happens if they bleed? Well, you take two fingers, you put it above the insertion site and put pressure. And if the physician is already gone, you say, hey, get the doctor back here. Now, what's the treatment? You're still going to hold it. But they need to look and see how much blood was missing. Do you need to do a repeat CBC and make sure they didn't miss too much? You know, too much is, has been, um, came out. So number one, please check that dressing because what? The biggest risk is hemorrhage, any age child. So when you get that kid back, you're going to be doing number one, check the dressing. Then you're going to be, you know, checking pulses. And then the right one's going to be slightly decreased. That's normal. There were big things in that right side. Normal, as long as there's capillary refill. You are going to do your vital signs. You're going to make sure they either have IV or they're getting oral. They need something to drink. And then because they're so temperamental with glucoses, um, did they get sugar in the lab or didn't they in their IV fluids? You need to check a blood glucose. It could be too low or it could be too high. You, you need to check those things. Also, that leg that had that cardiac cath on must be left straight. Straight. You cannot bend the knee. You need it straight because it puts undue pressure on the site where those two catheters came from. And they need to be, I don't care, adult, child, bed rest 24 hours. Okay. So that's cardiac cath. Now, congenital heart defects. I never knew how many there was until I went and changed from the newborn ICU. And when Dr. Uh, Redmond Burke came from Harvard down to Nicholas, um, they opened the cardiac ICU. And I loved hearts. From the moment I went to newborn ICU, I changed over into his unit. I didn't realize how many kids had cardiac issues. And I fell in love with them. I fell in love with the parents. I fell in love with the children. These are amazing, amazing children and parents. Um, it's it's hard to be there because you become their friends. I mean, they're in cardiac cath. They're coming in and out. They're having multiple surgeries. You get to know these people. I've got some lifelong friends from children and several have died. And I'm still their friends because of what did I do for them when I took care for them? I always made it fun for the parent and the child. So um, cardiac is a difficult place to work, but it's one of the most rewarding. And you'll see nurses get there and 40 years later, they, they leave it, okay? They don't ever want to leave their hearts. Now, okay, that being said, it is the number one cause of death after small premature babies. You know, there's all sorts of things, but um, cardiac is, is there. The most common is a hole between the ventricles, which is called a ventricle septal defect. Think about there's atriums and there's ventricles, right? And in between, there's a separation that is called a septum or a septal. So you have Atrial septal defects is the upper chambers and ventricular septal defects, which is the lowers. And the most common diagnosis congenital person is that child with Downs. Really, you have to be careful. They are the most apt to have some sort of congenital heart defect. They're very high on VSDs. They're on truncus and there's AV canal. These are the three. You don't have to know those. I'm just telling you, very high on a congenital defects. So they're looked at closely. Now, I talked to you a little bit about blood flow or shunting, okay, is another word for it. So we have congenital heart defects. 
Some of the kid is blue. It's called cyanotic. And some of them will keep O2 sat to 75. And we're okay with that in some children, okay? And I'm not going to explain it way too much. But some of them are, are left there, and that's cyanotic. And then there's VSDs and ASDs that are just absolutely not cyanotic. Blood is still flowing. Blood's still going to the lungs and still going to the body. You might have recirculation of some blood but it uh, to the lungs, but it, uh, you still have oxygen. Now, look at the picture. The left atrium, remember I told you, you have four pulmonary veins going into the left atrium. And the right atrium, the blood is just getting there after the heartbeat, right? So flow, high to low. Well, if there's a hole or an atrial septal defect or even a ventricular septal defect, that side is high pressure. Where's blood going to go? Back to the right side and back to the lungs. And that is what we call increased pulmonary blood flow. And this is something in your book. This is right out of it, and it really describes a lot of things. Now, atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, it's a whole, the side is higher pressure, it's going to push to the right side. It's what it does. Where does the blood go in the right side? Back up into the lungs. Increase flow, simple. Now, patent ductus arteriosus, what is this? Well, how do children live inside mommy fetal circulation? It is this patent ductus arteriosus. It's a connection between the lungs and the body. So pulmonary artery, lungs, and aorta, which is the body. It's a tube that connects, all right? So blood can go from the lungs back into the body, or even it can go from the body the aorta back into the lungs. It's just part of that back and forth, but oxygen can be going on. Now, when you're pregnant, you produce this hormone called prostaglandins, and that keeps it open. Well, once the baby's born, mommy's gone, prostaglandins are gone, and usually this patent ductus arteriosus closes. There are some conditions that are dependent on keeping it open to get the child oxygenated and to keep alive. One of them is tricuspid atresia, which is underneath decreased pulmonary blood flow. And the other one is under mixed blood flow called transposition of the great arteries. So patent ductus, keep it open. How do we do that after birth? We need it. We got to get oxygen to this infant. Well, we give something called prostaglandins. It's synthetic. You give a slow, it's very slow, very slow, continuous infusion of prostaglandins. And that's like mimicking what mommy did. So it keeps it open. So it keeps this baby alive till we can do surgery. And it works great. Now. Sometimes you don't want that open. It happens a lot, I see, in the premature. And um, I have another slide, and I'll go into that. We can close it with medications, too. Let's move over to the right. Obstructions, we know coarctation already. Or any problem with any valve that's, you know, you're going to have to know the word atresia and stenosis. A is without, absent, not there. Where is the tricuspid valve? Between the right atrium and right ventricle. Blood don't go there. Doesn't go to the right ventricle. Well, how does it get to the lungs? It doesn't. The right ventricle's not there. That's where the pulmonary artery is. So this is the one that needs that PDA open to keep the oxygen going, right? From the lungs and to the body. Now, the most, um, the other thing is stenosis, and that's just narrowing. That means blood is still going, but it's restricted, and it could be on, you know, a little bit, a large, or a lot. 
um, all different things. And usually they just will go and dilate those valves. It's basically how they treat it most of the time. Tetralogy of Fallot. Ever hear of a tet spell or blue baby? Baby all of a sudden turns blue. Well, something happens with the pulmonary artery. I mean, that's the blood that goes into the lungs from the right ventricle. Something happens where it spasms close or a piece of tissue covers it and nothing can get into the lungs. I was taking care of little Nathan one night at four or five in the morning, just, you know, changing him, whatever. I was combing his hair, making him pretty, doing those things that I do. And he had a tet spell. He was at 100% oxygen. And in a minute, it seemed like 10 seconds to me, his O2 sats were 10. What did I have to do? Well, there's several things that can be done. But what could I do as a nurse without an order? We call the doctor, of course, stat to get in there. But what did I do? We do something called knee to chest. So you take the knees, take the heads, and push them together. And what did that do? Your abdominal cavity and your chest cavity are different pressures. That forced to pop open the pulmonary artery, and it got blood flowing on this child. This is why children who are not fixed early, that maybe toddlers, they could have tet spells. You know what they do automatically? They squat on there immediately. And it's the same thing as knee to chest, isn't it? That abdominal cavity goes up into the chest and pops it open. Tetralogy is the most common of all cyanotic heart diseases. This is going to be tested on every test you ever see. This will be on HESI. This will be on HENCLEX. They love tetralogy of flow. So I'm just warning you. Now that mixed blood flow, we talked slightly Transposition of great arteries. Basically, the two vessels are backwards. So the lungs go around in a circle and systemic goes and there's no mixing. Transposition of the great arteries. So of course, we need to have that patent ductus open because we need oxygen. And usually these kids, we wait for five to seven days to get their surgery done get them slightly larger. They do well on prostaglandins. They don't need to be intubated. Mommy gets to feed them a bottle and then they go to surgery. They take the top of the heart off, turn it around and put it back on. It's literally what they do. And keeping in mind there's coronary arteries there to have to go with it too. It is a really intensive surgery, but these kids actually do really, really, really well. Um, Sometimes we have to put holes in between atriums or make them balloon bigger. Um, but we do an arterial switch, which is the um, turning them around. This is a child that you're not going to give oral medicine. It's not going to do anything. It is those IV medicines and the prostaglandins that this keeps this child alive. So here again, I'm talking PDA again, all right? Very difficult concept to understand. So we know it's fetal circulation. We know that mom keeps it open with her prostaglandins and at birth it's gone. Many times at birth, if you can listen to their chest, it's like a washing machine. You can hear it like a washer machine in there. What is pretty neat about it though, is many cardiac children, they're anticipating surgery. So they put in arterial lines to monitor blood pressures because they're going to go to surgery. They need that for surgery, right? When we look at a normal blood pressure for a infant, a neonate, brand new, 60 over 40 is like our 120 over 80. Okay, that 60 over 40 is not going to be in a child with a patent ductus that's open, wide open you're going to see 60 over 18. That's a wide pulse pressure. What's the neatest thing about this is many times um, medically we can close it and the nurses give these um, three different doses of something we called indomethacin. It's here on the bottom. Up to three doses, 
we monitor their liver, their kidneys um, during it because it could be a little nephrotoxic. But as a nurse, if you're giving it, you can listen to the murmur disappear and you can watch the arterial line, the bottom number, the diastolic, go back up to 30s. And you know that PDA is now closed with the medicine that you've given, even before they do a um, uh, echocardiogram. I mean, as a nurse, I love to look for these things and listen for these things. I wanted to know when it happened. So, you know, that's why I say you can follow these things. You know, one of the things, prostaglandins, yes, it gives oxygen um, to the baby when they wouldn't have it. But with that oxygen, it's also they can have now cardiac output. So that's what prostaglandins does. Cardiac output and O2 sat levels. There's a couple slides here. Basically what I've said, I leave them in here for you to look at. You've seen it. I've talked to you about it. Um, so um, if you want to look closer, those slides are there for you. Now, congestive heart failure, as I said, can happen. It could be usually in adults as a weak heart, right? The heart gets weak. In children, it's usually the structure, like that coarctation of the aorta, the kink in the hose, the narrowing of the aortic um, art, um, artery. It's, it's just getting kinked. Blood won't go down. It goes back and it the whole left side is full of fluid up into the lungs. So when we look at congestive heart failure, number one, why did it happen? So if we can correct that, we don't need to give medicines. But usually congestive heart failure, we're going to have to give them something to help them. They're infants. They don't have any backup. They don't have any reserve. The lungs are going to be full, 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 full of fluid. What is our goal? As nurses, what do we want to do for these children? Well, number one, we want their heart to be efficiently, right? It gets blood and oxygen to the body and to the brain and that's what we want. You know, it's, we don't want to starve the body like that. We want to get that fluid off. You know, we need to let that heart be easier and we need our oxygen saturations up. So what are we going to be monitoring most of all? Intake, output, daily weight. If we see that the output's more than the input, that's what we want. It could be two or 300 mLs of fluid in there. That's a lot on a newborn infant. Think about it. It's a whole big glass full of something. That is a lot of fluid on a brand new baby. So one of the things that we do help, now the heart's a little weak. It's been pumping harder. It can't, you know, go against these kinks. And it's just weak and it needs help. Now, digoxin is used all the time in the elderly, the, the, you know, the adults, right? You see it all the time. Well, we use it all the time in children too. How do you treat digoxin? How do we give it as pediatric nurse practitioners? Well, ding, ding, apical pulse, one minute. You're going to look at that potassium level. If it's lower than 3.5, which is the low norm, we're not going to give it. We gave digoxin with that low level, it can cause dig toxicity. And one of the things I teach parents as they are getting ready more to go home, and a lot of them go home on digoxin, is if your infant for no reason starts vomiting, it could be dig toxicity, right? Maybe the only thing you see, um, their heart rate may not have gotten that slow yet. I mean, the two things, vomiting, you'll see that even that retching, which is almost like a nausea, and then heart rate. Usually they'll say heart rate's less than 100, hold the digoxin and call me, or hold it, do dig level, whatever it is. So digoxin slowers and strengthens that force of contraction, and it squeezes you know, the fluid coming out, it sends it to the kidneys and it increases urine output, right? 
And during this time, when they're all full of fluids, we usually will not feed them orally. Many times we'll put a feeding tube of some sort because these children don't have any energy. They can't suck, swallow, and breathe. It's just too much. So we let them rest. We'll give them a pacifier. That is absolutely what you need to do, but we won't give them formula or breast milk in the mouth because they don't have that energy. And you need nutrition. No nutrition, they're not going to be alert, oriented in cognition. It's not going to be where it needs to be. So we always are concerned about nutrition with that. And as we're doing all these things, we're letting the parents know why we're listening. And I actually teach parents how to take a pulse. So if they're vomiting, they can listen to the heart rate, see what it is, and when they need to call the doctor. Now, hypoxemia, <clears throat> many conditions. Now, the one thing I didn't mention in the mixed um, type of defects, something called a hypoplastic left heart. It is the most severe and, quote, worse type of defect you can get. It's three stages of surgery, and many end up with transplants in the end. It is a lot, a lot of work. Now, this is the child that's going to have 65 to 75 O2 saturations at birth, and that's where we want them, okay? And as we do surgeries, we might get up to 90 with the third stage surgery. With that child who's always with low saturations, what are we going to see? Well, they're going to have that coloring change. They're not going to be as pink as a child with normal saturations, right? As they get older, that's the clubbing, that hand right there that you might see. That's probably a hypoplast child right there. And the other thing you're going to see is something called polycythemia. And what is that? Well, your body says, I don't have enough oxygen because your O2 saturations are, let's say they're 75, right? They're not high enough. The body wants over 90. So the body says, you know, I'm going to help. I'm going to make red blood cells. And they continue to make red blood cells. So instead of a 14 and a, you know, 14 and a 30, 42, um, hemoglobin hematocrit, it might be 18 and 60. I mean, it's crazy how high these hemoglobin hematocrits get. And that is called polycythemia. The body is trying to make up for oxygen depletion. Now, cardiac children are special. Remember, these children, many of them are extremely complicated and they're going to go home. And I'm telling you, cardiac families are amazing. They are, you know, you just want to hug them all the time. They're so good. Uh, really care about their children. They're always at the hospital. Always, always, always. I, I, I've, you know, my heart goes out to them. So you've got to help them. Number one, that first night, let them like be aware of what's going on. And I hug them. I'm telling you, every new cardiac child that came in. And I worked night shift for like 23 years. I love night shift. Very autonomous. I love being a nurse at night. And I would take that mother and I put my arm around them once I got to know them a little bit, of course. And I'm saying, listen, you didn't do anything wrong here. It wasn't a glass of wine. It wasn't a Tylenol. It was nothing you did. You know, do not think this is your fault. And I want you to know parents appreciate that. What is, a, I mean, think about a person who just had a newborn, a mother. They're hormonal. And now they're worried they've got this kid, hypoplastic left heart. They didn't know before the baby was born or even transposition. They usually don't know these before they're born. So you as a nurse are vital in helping the beginning of a long-term relationship with his family. You're always going to educate. Everything I do, I would be talking. Why am I doing? How am I doing? What to look for? What does this mean? And these parents become little nurses. 
they become really, really good because why? They got to manage these kids at home, don't they? Right? Children, as they get older, like that hypoplast, we do a surgery at birth. We do a surgery about six to eight months. Then we do a surgery about three months. And in between, I mean, three years. And in between, we're doing cardiac casts. So these children are in all the time having invasive procedures. What did I say? The most scared child is who? The one that's that repeat visitor, right? The one that keeps coming back, coming back, coming back. So these children, you really need to prepare. This is child life. Get them in there. Let them see. Let them look. I'm not going to let a child look at another kid post up, but I might take a parent out and show them what to be prepared for. It is a lot of equipment. It is scary. So make sure that they know what to expect. And then as you're doing, when you're going to take things off, little time frames, and they really do appreciate it. I mean, I would send parents, okay, nothing's going to happen now. I want you to go get four hours sleep. And I promise you, anything happens, I will send someone to get you because I will not leave your child. And I would have parents going to sleep for four hours at night. And that was a big deal for them because they didn't sleep. They were too scared. And always, any patient, you know, child, adult, you're always preparing for home on admission. So this is another thing that talks about cardiac cath. You know, we've already gone over it. It's just another reiteration of it. You can read it. Bacterial endocarditis, you know, strep infection due to whatever reason. Uh, we don't always know why, but these children uh, will be getting a prophylaxis before dental, before cardiac cath, before anything that's, you know, invasive. Uh, we don't want to spread that staph or the strep around. Now, strep throats, we don't think they're a big deal, do we, right? They're just strep throat. It means other kids can get them. You've got to be careful. Don't drink the drinks. They'll take an antibiotic and they'll be all better, right? Well, strep throat can turn into rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease. And when would that happen? That would happen when a parent doesn't take, have the child take all the medicine or doesn't follow up with the doctor to make sure the strep is gone. Strep that remains in the body starts to attack the body. It attacks the joints, the skin, the brain, and the heart valves, especially the mitral valve. And it can also, with the brain, cause something called chorea, which is the awkward movements. Now, child comes in, usually, and they have, sometimes they have a rash on them too. Usually with rheumatic fever, you know, they come in because now the walking is weird or the movements and now they're scared. And we will do something called an ASO titer. It's an anti-streptolictin titer. And it's strep is in the middle of, of the word of it. And it shows us strep is still in this body. So how do we treat a strep infection? Well, now they're on long-term antibiotics for at least a month. Everything will turn around and go back to normal, except the heart valve. Once it's damaged, it's damaged for life. And then they might have to do surgery or not, or it will have to be closely followed. Hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, kids? Oh, yes. Yes, they can. We have found that kids are apt to have it too. So it's something now that we are checking for. Cardiac dysrhythmias. <clears throat> Cardiac dysrhythmias could be slow, fast, or irregular. Um, it could be heart blocks. Children small, I've seen toddlers get pacemakers in, okay? So um, children can have these dysrhythmias. And again, we treat them very similar to adults. We put them on beta blockers. We put them on digoxin, or we put them on a tenolol, or any, I mean, all of these drugs. You've heard them in uh, pharmacology. They fast up, slow up, or even out your, your heart rate. Um, and it they are treated about the same. Another thing that can occur is something called pulmonary artery hypertension. 
a lot of times this happens with your premature infants where their lungs have been damaged by the oxygen in the prematurity and, you know, the damage of that ventilator ventilating against their lungs. And it, it's a lifelong condition. And what they need to do, what happens with these children, if they're not getting proper treatment, they don't get oxygenated. So they get short of breath. They get dizzy, oxygen deprived, right? And then that tightness in the chest. What we started to use, and I was marveled with, but Viagra is used a lot for pulmonary artery hypertension in children. Cardiomyopathy, we talked about what can happen, could be due to, again, that viral thing or lupus thing, and the heart gets big and floppy. And we can give medications to help, but it's not going to work forever. And then they're going to need a transplant. Transplants are big. Nicholas doesn't do it. Children's does. Um, um, Jackson does. Um, we've not one done one at Nicholas um, because we don't have all the team for it. And it's better a place that does more than just one a year or one every five years. And the biggest thing you need to know about transplant is rejection is the largest reason for death. And these children will be on um, immunosuppressive therapy for life. It's not just once, it's going to be for life. Children having surgery for cardiac will get chest tubes. They could have one, two, three, four, doesn't matter, but they need to come out. And I used to work in the adult area. And the adult area, the adults told me when it pulls out, the doctor does it, even with pre medication, it burns and it's miserable but it's for a short period of time. So you need to take chest tubes out of an infant, put them on their back, slightly elevated, pre-medicate them. So you're gonna take vitals first, pre-medicate them. You're gonna tell that child what they're gonna do in a manner that they understand and you let them know. Even with the pain medicine, it hurts for a little bit, but I'll hold your hand and we'll count to 30 together and it should be gone. And that's all they wanna know, be honest with them, okay? We started checking children younger for blood pressures. We used to not do it under the age of five. Why, nobody has a high blood pressure. Well, yes, they do. What happens in un, not treated hypertension in adults? Well, you could ruin your kidneys, right? Same thing in kids. And then Kawasaki disease, last disease. This is something, and why is it here in cardiac? It is a systemic vasculitis, vascular. Coronary arteries are vascular. They get all inflamed, microembolus, and then you could get aneurysms in coronary arteries that can burst. So it could be life-threatening. It is a viral disease. It's symptoms, red eyes, red cracked lips, strawberry tongue. Sometimes you'll see the nodules. Hands and feet be peely, scaly, okay? How do we treat it? It's a virus. Well, we give them intravenous immunoglobins and we give high dose aspirin. Only time we give aspirin to children. And why aspirin? Well, it's a blood thinner and it will decrease the clots and prevent coronary arteries from being clotted off. Shock, I've already said this several times, the biggest thing in shock is sepsis in children. Elevated heart rate, decreased blood pressure, decreased urinary output, very poor capillary refill, right? These are all things you see with shock. So uh, let's see if anybody can answer this one. Surgical closure of the patent ductus arteriosus does what? That's the connection between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So we close it. They actually just put a staple, they clamp it. Blood doesn't go there anymore. So what happens? D. It is D, it is D. It prevents the blood from going back to the lungs. So it can't go up off the order and poof, go right there. 
anybody have questions, I made it right to a little bit after 10. I wish you all a happy Halloween. I will be sending you the other recording. Please look at the cahoots. It, there's 59 questions. Extremely important. Very good concepts there. Okay, guys? Have a great night. If you want to review exams, please let me know. Or anybody has a diagnosis, please let me know.